before we left class um, last Wednesday or a couple of weeks ago, um, we had listened to Josquin's piece, Absalon Philimi, uh, and we heard in that these various elements, hopefully you heard in these um, in his piece, these various elements of his style, the lyric quality, uh, the fact that he was able to set the... Um, the text so eloquently, the richness of harmonies, the the very the, the innovative qualities that he had in uh, the way he introduced um, new harmonies, new uh, things as well, uh, his sensitivity to the text, the way he said it, the chromaticism, which especially appears at the end of the piece, um, and those other things as well. So we talked about those in class, so hopefully you heard those. Let's move on to the next composer we're going to deal with. Um, these composers in discussing in this class, Josquin, and then the next one that we're going to be discussing are so important to uh, our understanding of music in the Mass because the Renaissance period is um, its a time when development of liturgical music took on a rapid pace. We talked about in the Renaissance that we had various national schools developing. Josquin, of course, was the Flemish, the Franco-Flemish uh, school. Um, so it was France and the Low Countries. And now we're going to talk about the English school. As you might recall from history, the Church of England separates in 1532, and that was done by King Henry VIII, uh, who was a tutor. And <laughs> that's an image of Jonathan Rhys Myers, who played Henry VIII. Uh, and that, of course, is a painting of the actual Henry VIII. Um, Henry VIII was a, a very uh, powerful monarch, one of the most powerful monarchs in all of British history. Uh, and the reforms took place, uh, the Church of England separating, had more to do uh, with politics than with uh, liturgical aspects. So a lot of the liturgy for the Church of England remains so similar to the Roman Catholic Church. So if, you, if we have any students who are Episcopalians, um, or if you've ever been to an Episcopalian church, the rituals of the Episcopalian church, the Anglican church, are very similar to the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Thomas Tallis was an important uh, composer of the, uh, you like that little wiggle there, <laughs> of the English school. And his uh, student was the composer we're really going to focus on. Uh, his name is William Byrd. Thomas Tallis was a, uh, a court musician in the court of Henry VIII. Uh, William Byrd. Uh, was one of Thomas Tallis's students, and he wrote um, both Latin masses and motets and services and anthems. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, one of his uh, Latin uh, pieces, uh, Viterunt Omnes. So let's take a uh, let's talk about William Byrd's style for a little bit. He's the last significant Catholic composer in England. So Henry VIII, uh, the Pope had called Henry VIII uh, defender of the faith. He was the king of England, but he's also the one who left uh, the Catholic Church and, and established the Church of England in 1532. And if you recall from your history, you remember why he did it. He wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn. Uh, there was a lot of political maneuvering, uh, the Pope denied his request uh, to declare his marriage to Catherine of Aragon uh, null. Uh, it wouldn't happen, so uh, Henry VIII used the bishops of the church in England to agree with him, <clears throat> and so he separated from the Roman Catholic Church and established the Church of England during his reign. So William Byrd comes along just after that. So he's the last really significant Catholic composer in England. Um, so he's just at the 
uh, during the English uh, Church Reformation. His uh, Graduale of 1607 begins with a proper for Christmas Day, and that's what we are going to focus on uh, for this piece, the piece that we're going to listen to. And it's called Viterant Omnes. It's the psalm or the gradual of the Mass for Christmas Day. And the Alleluia Dia Sanctificatus is the Alleluia for the Mass of Christmas Day. So these two pieces kind of go back to back. Both of these pieces show Bird's mastery of imitative counterpoint. What is imitative counterpoint? Um, so that's where you have counterpoint that's built upon each voice imitating uh, the one previous to it. Uh, so we have, um, as you heard in Josquin's music, you heard some of those voices, the way they entered was staggered. Um, well, Bird helps to develop this, that kind of staggered effect where the voices imitate one another, or they'll sing themes uh, that are very similar. So, <laughs> getting a text there. Uh, so he weaves, using the inter imitative counterpoint, he weaves together um, related but independent melodic lines. And it's also his ability to highlight the text. So he uses this imitative counterpoint to give us textual highlights, like he's saying in the music that this is important to listen to, these words are important. Um, he also uses homophonic settings. So what is homophony? We've studied monophonic and polyphonic music. Monophonic is unison singing uh, of one line Polyphonic, we said, is two more independent voices singing at the same time. Homophonic setting is two or more voices singing this um, in harmony at the same time, the same words. So he gives us uh, polyphony, but he also uh, adds into that homophonic texture, which is important to realize. Um, and he gives us to the um, he gives us various things to to point out this these texts, and so that's one of them. Um, he also gives us this burst of sunlight, uh, which happens at the Alleluia. It's like in this different key, and it just kind of uh, as you listen to the music, you hear this kind of like when the Alleluia comes, it's like something completely different. And by using this homophonic setting at the Alleluia, where all the voices are singing Alleluia at the same time, and with this new key, it gives this burst of sunlight, like uh, announcing that Jesus is born. You'll also hear in the music, sorry, that burst of sunlight comes at the Dies Sanctificatus. Uh, the Alleluia is the homophonic setting, excuse me. So homophonic setting we hear at the Alleluia, the burst of sunlight happens at the Dia Sanctificatus. Uh, and then you'll hear in the Adorate section, Bird paints this picture of the shepherds running to the manger to adore the newborn king. So he uses the text to kind of tell the story in a musical way. And so when you listen to it, we're not going to listen to it fully here um, because of the limitations of YouTube and, and the, the slideshow. But I need you to listen to that on your own. Listen to those elements of his style. The imitative counterpoint, where one voice will imitate the other. The textual highlights. The homophonic setting that you hear at the Alleluia. The burst of sunlight which happens at the Dies Sanctificatus. And at the Adorate, the shepherds running to the manger. Here's his music. Um, you're going to listen for those various things. The translation of this text is, All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Sing joyfully to God all the earth. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his justice in the sight of the Gentiles. Alleluia. And then the Dia Sanctificatus begins, A holy day has dawned for us. Come, you Gentiles, and adore the Lord. For on this day a great life light 
has descended upon the earth. Alleluia. I'll let you listen to that on your own, but we're going to skip ahead. <laughs> So now we come to probably for our class one of the most important composers that you will discuss. This one, uh, when I'm with you in class, I will say a couple of times if you don't know who Palestrina is by the end of this semester, by the end of taking this course, I have not done my job. Palestrina is so important in the history of the Catholic Church. He's probably, as I said, the most important composer. Um, in the history of the Catholic Church. Uh, I think that's kind of, that can be said without too much argument. So his name is Giovanni de Palestrina, but most people call him by his last name, Palestrina. He had a lasting influence on the development of church music, and his work has often been cited as the culmination of Renaissance polyphony. He is of the Roman school uh, because most of his life's work was done in Rome. Uh, and he does have this lasting influence on the Catholic Church. He, his, um, he's also the culmination of the Renaissance. So he's, he's kind of the height of the Renaissance period of music. He's also the height of the Council of Trent which, of course, we know is the, um, the archetype of the Counter-Reformation that the Catholic Church undertook to, um, to counter, to, well, to address the reforms that the Protestant uh, reformers uh, had brought light of. You know, the problems with the Catholic Church and the Council of Trent is how the Catholic Church responded to that. His Misa Sine Nomine, which you can see the title there in the spelling, seems to have been particularly attractive to Johann Sebastian Bach many years later. We'll get to study Johann Sebastian Bach, but as you might recall, Johann Sebastian Bach, if you haven't heard his name before, uh, we'll get to him in a couple of days. But he's probably one of the greatest composers of all time, of all music. But Johann Sebastian Bach... Uh, was influenced by uh, Palestrina's Misa Sine Nomine. And it seems that Bach, years later, studied it and performed it while writing the Mass in B minor, Bach's Mass in B minor, which we will study as well. So it's kind of important to realize how various composers influence the other. So Palestrina is writing in the 16th century, and Johann Sebastian Bach, is writing in the 18th century. He worked in um, some of the most important Roman churches, uh, the Basilica of St. John Lateran, which is the Pope's Cathedral. He worked in the Basilica of St. Mary Major, and he also worked in the Papal Chapel that we call the Sistine Chapel, which of course is one of the most important uh, uh, choirs uh, in all of Catholicism. As a part of the Council of Trent, he was commissioned to supervise the revision of the chant books. And the Council Fathers and the Council of Trent, they wanted to make Gregorian chant more accessible to common people uh, because it was more difficult with all of its um, melismas. And so that was one of his jobs. And so the way he did that was to, uh, working with others, to realign the texts and the melodies, and he also created transpositions <coughs> to make the keys a little easier for people to sing. And he also took out many of those beautiful melismas. Um, we talked about melismatic uh, singing, and so he took out some of those melismas to make, again, the Gregorian chant easier. Now, we're going to be talking about... Uh, in a couple of classes, we'll talk about um, the the way that um, later people wanted to go back to the original chant. But this is Palestrina's work because the Council of Trent, the, the Council Fathers, had asked him to make the chant uh, revised to 
to realign the text and the melodies, to transpose them, to, more, to make them more singable uh, by the people and, the, and uh, shortening a lot of those long, long melismas. One of uh, Palestrina's most enduring works uh, was the Misa Pape Marcelli, or the Pope Marcellus Mass. I'm not sure exactly why the title isn't coming up there, but it's the Pope Marcellus Mass, uh, which in Latin we call the Misa, Misa Pape Marcelli. It was composed, some believe, that was uh, composed in order to persuade um, the church fathers at the Council of Trent to oppose the ban on polyphony. There had been a, uh, a proposed ban to ban all polyphonic music in the church. And of course, many people realized that that wasn't necessarily a good thing. Uh, and so some believe that this might have been uh, written to oppose that ban. And it's possible uh, or probable that uh, this composition did influence the Council Fathers at the Council of Trent. Um, there was a conscious need for intelligible texts because sometimes with polyphony it's a little difficult to understand the words. Oh, there's the title, finally. And if you look on page 78, it's important to um, to take a look at what uh, our author uh, that we're reading, uh, Edward Schaefer, what he writes about Palestrina and the influence of the Misa Pape Marcelli. There are two pieces that I'd like you to listen to as a part of this Mass, and one is the Kyrie. Um, you can see in this music here, we're not going to listen to it right now because of the same restrictions, but this Mass is written for six parts, soprano and alto, and then four men's voices, tenor one, tenor two, bass one, and bass two. And you can see in this opening line, if you look at all six parts, you see who enters first, who sings first, it's the tenor one. And then you look at who's the next voice to sing, and that would be soprano. And if you look at the next voice, who's the next to sing, it is bass one. And then alto. And then finally we get tenor two. And then right after that we get bass two. And if you look at just the pattern of the notes, so take a look at the soprano line and take a look at the tenor two line. You can see in the pattern of notes, even if you can't read music, you see those long notes for the ki, ri, a, a, and then you see that long descending line of notes, those black notes there. Um, the soprano line and then the second tenor line, if you look at that, it looks very similar. Uh, the same can be said of the tenor one line, the first person to sing, and the alto line, and the bass two line. Those also look kind of similar. So that's the kind of thing you'll be listening for in this imitative counterpoint. It's not always clear to pick that up as you're listening to it, but if you listen very closely, you can hear how some of the voices imitate one another uh, as they sing. You'll also want to, um, I thought there were two pieces from the Missed Pape Marcelli, maybe I only included one, but I thought there was, there was the glory as well. So <laughs> he's just flipped in, Tom, Tomas Luis de Victoria. He is a Spanish composer. Uh, sometimes he's called the Spanish Palestrina. Uh, he is a very important composer of the Counter-Reformation. And he, along with Palestrina and some other composers, were very important and very influential. So he's writing in Spain. He's a part of the Spanish school. Um, he was an organist as well as a singer and a composer. Um, he may have been taught by Palestrina. A lot of his music is very similar to it. 
uh, and I would encourage you to read the text on page 79 of the reading for uh, lecture number 10. The piece of Tomas Luis de Victoria is this gorgeous piece, Ovos Omnes, which is sung uh, during Holy Week. It's a very uh, mournful song. <clears throat> As you can see here, just the way the voices enter, it is... Uh, you have that one, the first voice that enters is the tenor two line. And then tenor one, bass two, and bass one all enter at the same time after tenor two. Um, here, let's look for any pattern of imitative counterpoint. These are a little more subtle in the way that might entertain, uh, uh, imitate one another. I'm looking at it. It's not completely clear on this first one, but you may hear it uh, as you uh, go through the piece. So that's it for uh, class number 10. I just want to do this short um, pickup since I didn't get to, um, to discuss all of these composers in class with you on Wednesday. Uh, I think it was the uh, Ninth or tenth or something? No, not the ninth or tenth. It was the seventh. You know what I'm talking about? That Wednesday that we finally had class together. Okay, so that's it for today. Make sure you listen to those composers because they will be on the midterm. <laughs>